major VCs in private telling me, I can't say anything out loud, but this thing is going to go to zero. And if it's a really large thing like Luna FTX, no one's going to speak out loud. Why were you able to? You were the biggest voice saying Luna was unsustainable. Why were you able to do that? Please welcome Steady Lads is the rising star of the crypto podcast. Hosted by Jordi Alexander, the founder of Selene Capital. Justin Bram, the CEO at Asteria, and Taiki Maida, the humble farmer. Why did you launch Steady Lads? So this was in the middle of the bear market. We could probably get any co-host we wanted to do a podcast. I like the idea of providing some thought leadership. So you have to do it in a really entertaining way. And in crypto, our attention spans are like five seconds. If you don't say something interesting, you've already lost your viewer. Why is it so hard to not buy the dip or to sell when something is crashing? I think people get religiously attached to an asset. An asset's like a football team. People get conditioned to believe that a certain action makes money. And then it keeps happening until it doesn't. If ETH crashes 50% tomorrow, Bitcoin does. It's an amazing opportunity to now reallocate to something you think is going to be strong in the next decade. There's two types of podcasts. You have the very small audience, but very educational. And then you have like the very big audiences, a lot of retail listening, right? You don't want to try to become the number one in a category that exists. You want to create your own category. There is this psychology in crypto where you say, the thing pumped, I feel like I missed it. And then we end up not buying. I've learned this lesson, but it's still so hard to actually take action just because. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that you said the other day, a question that is very fair. Did we really wash out the bad people after FTX. Mm. 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. And Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. Thank you so much, guys, for doing that. Uh, it's a crazy week and I know that just getting one person is hard, but like getting three <laughs> is even harder. And uh, yeah, almost didn't happen, but uh, thank you, Jordi, for... Uh, we made it. You know I love you, man. That's why. I love you too. <laughs> Gotta do it. I love you too. And that's why I didn't pour you any wine, only water. Good. Because I know you had a crazy week already. <laughs> and uh, cheers, guys. Cheers. cheers. Thanks for making this happen. Thanks for so having we're us. We're drinking um, a wine from uh, Divin, which is a podcast partner. And uh, they just launched yesterday on break, uh, during Breakpoint. Divin? Uh, Divin. Okay. Exactly. Divin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Centralized okay. wine. Okay. Um, when you uncork the bottle, you get an airdrop. So, and the more people drink <laughs> it, the more you receive tokens, basically. So I wanted to do it with you, right? So I can open the, the bottle here. Mm. It's on Solana, but I think there is an issue of, uh, of uh, yeah, network congestion. <laughs> so usually it's a, it's a barcode, you just scan, uh, link to your phantom or phone number or um, email, and then you just receive how, tokens. How could there be network congestion? Solana just announced they're doing 1 million TPS. This is just one TPS. <laughs> it's, it's coming soon. It's coming soon, soon. Coming yeah. Soon. Coming soon. Let's start with the basics. Who are the steady lads? It's a community, and we represent different sections of the community. Yes. And... We try to give a very consistent overall uh, outlook and evaluation of what's happening in the space in crypto. And when we were figuring out who to add to the show and what would be the best combination of three or four hosts, we all wanted to bring different backgrounds. And I think we do that really well. That's one of the really nice things about our show is that we're not just three VCs talking. We've got, well, one pseudo half VC, half market maker. <laughs> um, and then we've got Taiki, obviously the humble farmer, farmer who's been building a brand and an audience and also helping people learn. And then myself, who's uh, on the product market fit journey, trying to find PMF. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like a lot of the podcasts in this space are pretty fungible. It's just like, you know, it's just VCs talking about how VCs add, add value to the space. But I think we have more fun. Uh, we're not really afraid to call bullshit out in the industry. Um, and yeah, we just have fun. I feel like we're the fun podcast. That's the reason why I tune in every week, to be honest. I'm just, I'm, I know I'm going to learn some really cool stuff, right? But I don't, I don't come for that. I don't come for the alpha. I'm just like, I'm just going to have a loss for an hour because these dudes don't take them seriously, even if they're serious, right? <laughs> they don't. And so you each have a very different personality, right? 
very lovable. You make me laugh all the time just with your laugh, right? Okay, okay. And uh, and you're very, you know, direct way of talking. And you with your cop. I think it's amazing. <laughs> it's an amazing cop. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing Jordy's the lovable one? Jordy, Jordy is the shark behind, you know, behind the scenes. Jordy's the shark. At least shark. in front, he looks very lovable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And cute. He's cute, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why did you launch Steady Lads? I guess it was your idea, right, Justin? Oh. Yeah, so Taiki and I connected years ago, probably in 2020, 2021. We were both sort of starting out in the content space, and it was a small community then, still is now to some degree. So I reached out to Taiki. I said, listen, like, we both have pretty solid reach. We could probably get, like, any co-host we wanted, like, to do a podcast. And this was in the middle of the bear market, so there was really room to start something and grow into the bull. And um, Taiki reached out to Jordy. Jordy, of course, said yes, and... And then Jordy brought on Thicky. So I got Taiki, Taiki got Jordy, and Jordy got Thicky. You say we can get uh, anyone, which is probably true, but then you have to get someone who is there and smashing it every week, mm -hmm. which is much harder to do, especially for people who are extremely busy in the space, right? Because everybody wants, there was this kind of like uh, trend. Everybody wants to be a podcaster. It's cool. But like actually just doing it every week is a different thing. Yeah. You have to show up. And I put, I tweeted this. And I told everyone here uh, when we first started with, but I think 90% of podcasts don't make it past the third episode. Yeah. But out of the ones that survive, 90% don't make it past the 10th episode. So just by doing 10 episodes, you're already in the top 1%. So we just have to show up. A lot of people in the industry, they don't show up, right? When things get hard, they leave. But we, continu we continuously show up. Um, and I think people are starting to recognize that, okay, like these guys, you know, they're in it. You know, they're in it for the love of the podcast. And... Yeah, hopefully that resonates. I mean, for me, I don't know about you guys. It's like one of my favorite hours or two hours of the week. We get to talk to each other, which is obviously special. I'm learning a lot from these guys every single time. But we also have the privilege of being able to have really amazing guests on. And just learning from them has been fun. So for me, I don't view it as work. I think it's been an amazing experience and, yeah, a lot of fun. I'm a bit more um, goal-oriented and process-driven and... Um, I think it's a little bit of work. I'm trying to keep changing and improving the product. I've met like so many fans of the podcast during this week. And I ask most of them when I have a little bit of time to give me some ideas for improvement. And I've been chat putting them in our chat because I think it's an iterative process. You have to um, keep improving the, the product. So, so it's yeah. an ongoing evolution. Yeah, otherwise you, I mean, probably the first benchmark is, am I getting bored when I do it? Because I do it, because it's like every kind of business, right? You can optimize it for, I'm going to do one every week. That's 50 to a year. I have a sort of process. I'm going to ask the same, same questions to be much faster and more efficient. But if you do that, you're going to get bored. People are going to get bored and the thing's going nowhere. Whereas yeah. if, if you do this kind of constant thing, uh, like this product that is always improving, it's kind of starting almost from scratch for every episode. Mm -hmm. It's not very scalable, but that's what's going to make a difference. At least that's what I felt Yeah, I was doing this year. I, I think we did one live stream. I, I forget when, but we didn't really have that much structure. And I, th I think I, I kind of felt that this podcast had no energy and it was a live stream. So I just started like chugging coffee and I just like made some, I'm caffeinated as hell. Joke. <laughs> and then Jordy was like, yo, like we need direction. This, <laughs> this can't happen. And then from that point on, I think we've done better. Um, yeah. I think over time, I feel like the crypto audience as, as a whole isn't really growing, but I think our market share relative to other podcasts is growing. And that led us to, I guess, be able to have better guests. Um, so that also helps, right? Um, have been able to get a lot of people. But um, yeah, I, I think we do bring a good balance. Um, I, I do like Jordy's like, goal-oriented approach. Um, he kind of... You so, know, you, just, so you set goals like what, every week, every month? I think um, we can tell when we're... Yeah. Losing users, getting users. We, we read all the comments. We're very plugged in. We can see the influence we're having on the space sometimes and when when it's not there. Um, obviously, like recently, we had quite a large influence having Kane on that started this entire Ethereum debate now. So I think we're kind of um, in the thick of that, which is good. Ultimately, my goal for the podcast, I've wanted to potentially do a podcast of my own for a long time. I've, obviously, I've been on other people's podcasts for a long time. Um, I like the idea of having, um, a place where week after week we can provide some thought leadership on the space and you have to do it 
in a really entertaining way. Otherwise, people won't tune in. And in crypto, our brain cells have <laughs> gone to mush. Our attention spans are like five seconds. Mm. So if you don't say something interesting for like five minutes, you've already lost your viewer. So you'll notice that we have uh, post of the week. We have segments that are a little bit more lighthearted, fun, but still, I would say like educational or, or like um, thought provoking is the right word. I think also our effort has actually only increased over time as we get more excited about the show. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but when we first started recording, we were like on our recording call for one hour and that was pretty much it. And then we drop off and it was like very much, very coordinated, very rigid on schedule. But now our shows actually take longer and we still edit them down to the same length, but we're spending more time together making sure that the podcast is tight, making sure that our topics make sense. There's kind of two ways to look at crypto podcasting. One is uh, the kind of crypto Twitter echo chamber, right? And the other is uh, trying to break out of that. I feel like most crypto podcasts are actually in the crypto Twitter echo chamber. What's the ceiling there? And like, how do you get out of that? Because I think at the end of the day, a podcast is educational, right? So it should attract not only people from the space, but also other people. Otherwise, we're not doing our part of the job of like bringing more people. Well, we talked, actually, Rand gave us some really good advice on this when we had him on the show. And after we were just sort of discussing, and he said, I'm very top of funnel. I'm focused on bringing new people in talking about like, the space as a whole, I actually think like our podcast is quite niche and will probably stay niche. Like, I don't think we're, we're probably not on onboarding any users to crypto, right? I think we're just going after the crypto market for now. Would you guys agree with that? Our listeners are, for the most part, very, very crypto native. Yeah. Most of them work in the industry, I would say like at least half. Um, and I kind of like that. It, it, it lets us reach people who will then reach another layer. So the influence that a thought can have that's discussed in the podcast can filter out. How is starting a podcast similar to starting a company? You tell us, I mean, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a, like a little bit dis different model. Like we don't have sponsors. We're not trying to monetize at all. Why? We had a discussion the other day. Yeah. I think we all have different reasons for that individually but the reason why the show works is it's beneficial to all of us in our in our own way i think but i think just broadly speaking like the piece when people are trying to start companies in the space or just grow in our space the advice i give them to the extent that i'm qualified to give advice is you've got to build a brand for yourself because the work and everyone's work can be so commoditized right everyone is replaceable i truly believe that but if you have a brand for yourself you have reach uh, you have influence, and it's just so much easier to get conversations and get in front of the right people. And I think that's probably all of our goals, but they help us in different ways. What's some of the ways that you've seen the podcast helping you, each of you, since you started? The easiest is just like people um, knowing, you know, who you are, um, not just like as a name, but having a deeper understanding of you because they watch the podcast, li listen to you talking for a long time. There's a deeper connection, you're deepening the connection. So when you meet them, um, I'm very like, I hate wasting time. And if I can meet someone <laughs> and they, they already like know, I don't have to explain, you know, what I'm about, we can quickly get to the meet. Okay. Like, you know, you, you already know enough about me. Now let's just kind of discuss your product or, you know, the investment or what do we want to discuss? Saves a lot of time. And um, that's, that's been a huge for me. Yeah. Efficiency wise. Yeah. Like for me, I, I also have my own YouTube channel and I make a lot of content and it's really easy to burn out because when I post videos, I see the view count, it's just numbers on a screen. It's hard for me to visualize what that actually means. But when we had the study lads meetup event, we had like 300 to 400 people show up saying, oh my God, like, you know, I love you guys. We tune in every single week. I feel like it also gives me motivation to continue like trying uh, because building content during the bear, there's not that much payoff, right? You just you put in the work, but you're not really growing. I'm sure you can empathize, like, you know, just working, but not really seeing PMF. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it activates like the creative side of my brain and it gives me motivation to just keep going, keep going, keep going. And I even had the honor to like meet Vitalik because of the Kane podcast. And I feel like that's something that I would not have had the opportunity to if it weren't for the podcast. Uh, so, you know, just playing long-term games with 
long-term people um, going for the long-term, right? Um, and I think that's why we don't do sponsors or ads. Uh, I think people do see, yeah, like everyone else does that. So we'll, we'll just not do it, yeah. you know? I mean, I think you also just learn a ton doing a show every week. You have to, you, you can't tune out. You have to be interested. You have to pay attention to the space. And as far as reach goes, it is really fascinating. Like the numbers on a screen, it's hard to sort of comprehend what those mean. But I did, I went to so many talks at the main stage at Token. And, you know, for the main stage, they probably have 500 to 2,000 people at a given time at the stage. But our show is able to reach more people than that every week, you know, in the comfort of their home without them having to travel or pay to go, which is, it's just so exciting to see. But uh, to Taiki's point, you don't internalize that until you go out to a conference like this and actually meet people. When Steady Last Conference, you know, you have the all, all in guys who are basically, it's kind of a model you're following, right? <laughs> the all in of crypto. Yeah. And what they're doing is they're doing their, all con their own conference. When can we come to this one? I think after the event had such a huge um, response, it mm. was clear to us that that might be something to do next year. Mm. I wouldn't mind doing like a half day around one of these token events, maybe day before, day after, do like a half day, have some really fun guests and panels going on and do it around the content. I don't really like these um, events where it's just, you know, there's some panel, but like five people are talking and everyone's having drinks in the back and no one's paying attention. We would want to do it around the the actual stage and the actual content. So we would design something like that, I think. Yeah. yeah. And one thing we did that I don't think anyone else did was we did like live Q&A from the audience. And I think we had like the joke around, oh, Vitalik's girlfriend or something. And then we, I think some girl misunderstood and she raised her hands like, oh, are you Vitalik's girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, oh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. You get like that stand up. Like when you do it live, you, you get the stand up comedy element where something from the crowd can be an inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Do you plan on doing more of these like live events 100%. or live podcasts completely different? I mean, first we talked about the kind of in-studio thing already, which you're starting to do, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is a big difference in the kind of conversation. But then, then there's the next level, which is live podcast with a public. Um, we live in different parts of the world, but once in a while, you know, we're maybe going to be in the same place. Mm. So we can hopefully do more. The difference between doing in studio, which like you said, the conversations are better. Um, we have to rely on the strengths of digital. And that is something that I've tried to do in the past, which is get our editor to um, get graphics and like kind of show stuff or cut in clips of, you know, memes, movies, stuff like that. Um, I want to do more and more of that. I always tell the lads, um, it just, it, it keeps the dopamine hits coming quicker. And that's how we grow because my goal for the podcast there's two types of podcasts. You have like the very small audience, but very educational, very technical. And then you have like the very big audiences, like your BitBoy kind of things, big numbers. I don't know how much is bought it, but like there are like a lot of retail listening, right? They're kind of trash. So if you can um, do the quality Certainly. and the entertainment, that's the goal. And I don't think we're there. We're halfway there. Yeah. So... Yeah, it takes time, right? And I think there's this concept of log category where you don't want to try to become the number one in a category that exists. You want to create your own category. Mm. And I think that's what kind of what we're doing. We don't really, like n nothing like this exists. Um, I guess it does in other sectors, but in crypto, nothing like this exists. So yeah. um, I think we're just always changing what we talk about, the format. Um, it, it's funny because when I first reached out to you for you about like doing a podcast together and what that would look like, you were like, well... We could, but like, what are we going to do differently? Like everyone's doing the same thing in our space as far as podcasting, go, exactly. podcasting goes, like how can we be different? And I don't think we had an answer at the time, but I think we've sort of, with our different personalities and backgrounds, we've sort of grown into that, which yeah. is nice. And the, and the funny thing is, I mean, we're talking about the pod right now, but we don't really talk about the direction of the pod that much. Mm -hmm. And I guess our experiences the past year, so... Maybe we should do that more. We know when we've had a good episode, like, you yeah. know, when you finish an episode, you're Absolutely. like, okay, this one is going to be like... This was, it was electric, it was fun. And then, you know, we're the ones where, you know, either the guy just keeps talking over you, or you can't get the right topics, um, especially if it's a live stream. We've learned to be cautious on bringing in guests during a live yeah, stream. I remember it's the, his favorite. There was favorite one episode. specific one, I think. <laughs> uh, it was so fun. Yeah. Because your podcast, there is a lot of fun in there. I mean, you know that you can just maybe skip the part where he's talking, <laughs> but you still watch. 
because it's fun and then you see the reactions of the of you of you guys like and it's so <laughs> funny actually so i you i still have my entertainment yeah literally. It, i have it. it even charles hoskinson you know he came on <laughs> yeah he didn't know, know much about he didn't even know we were doing a live show we're, yeah. we're talking about his plushie like octo i, for, I forgot what that was but it yeah. was just so weird but but we had to break you like break is such a wrong word, but you must understand too. like you have to warm your guests up and they have mm -hmm. to get into it before, you know, they stop hitting their normal talking points. Like Charles has very specific talking points that he can just rely on. Mm -hmm. But once you get past that and people want to hear about his life, like no one needs to hear about Cardano anymore. <laughs> and I think we got there. It just took some time. time. Yeah. I can tell you in this studio, that's one of the things usually it takes 15, 20 minutes because they're just. I don't know if it's impressed or scared, right? You have like these super successful people, but you put them in front of three cameras, some lights, and then for the first 15 or 20 minutes, they're completely freaking, uh, freaking out. Or maybe and if you, you had a hair and makeup studio, that would help get us more comfortable. Or maybe, <laughs> or maybe more wine. Yes. Yeah, but most of them wine. don't drink. So like, that's the issue. I haven't found uh, the, the formula yet on how to make them like chill. One other thing that I've always done in the space, which, um, you know, initially I got some pushback on, but not anymore. I'm willing to have conversations with people that, um, you know, are kind of black sheep of the industry mm. or going on, um, you know, Rand's crypto banter show. That's so interesting. Um, back when like Zach XBT was, you know, going after him pretty hard. Um, you know, obviously we had Suzu as soon as he came out of jail. Uh, we've had Andre from DLWF, you know, uh, interesting firm. So... <laughs> Um, sometimes you'll get some comments like, don't give them a platform. What are you doing? The reality is if there's a conversation to be had, that's valuable mm. for listeners and, um, is worth having, I think you can separate out the conversation from what someone else is doing in, in their, you know, job somewhere else. Cause you're not endorsing them. You're having a conversation. What do you think about the celebrities in the space? Because I'm talking to a few of them. One is actually a pretty big one that might happen in October. I mean, it really depends on what I say. It's like huge. But again, I mean, they're looking for the credibility in the crypto space, right? I'm always thinking like, how do I not lose my credibility by bringing some people on? Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing it's I've kind of tough. The thing I've started to realize is that you know, once we have credibility, other people want to come on our show to like rent our credibility. So I think that's something that I think, I, I think we all have to in a way, right? It's like maybe having this person on will get us a bunch of views, but you know, if this person just shills their, their shit coin or something, then it makes the show look bad. Uh, so I think, I think that, you know, it's, there's like a pros and cons to everything. I, I do feel strongly though. Like I don't think our job really is to be the judge and Jerry for these people. I think there's other systems in place for that. And for me, if it's an interesting person and they have an interesting life story, I, I want to talk to them, whether it's for the show or not. And so for me, like, it's less top of mind, I would say. You're going to do it. Obviously, you're going to do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm going to do it. You're like, oh, uh, I'm so conflicted. <laughs> no, but, no, no, but the, one of the things is I recorded probably five or six episodes that I never released mm. because oh. they were not good enough mm. or they were too shilly or I'm going to do it. But then I'm going to decide, does this make sense to release or not? Right. Basically, because, and then the people are really pissed at you. And sometimes they're like, yeah, pretty big people or even in the space, right? But you're like, this was not a quality conversation. Yeah. You can be really big and not interesting, or you're just chilling something and like, this is zero value for uh, people. Mm. So you just don't release it. Yeah. I mean, and one of the really important things in to growing a podcast that I learned from a, a big podcaster who, uh, who I know is one of the biggest podcasters in the world, uh, is no filler episode, right? So you should always, I mean, ideally, you should always go higher and higher and higher and higher. And, and if you, as soon as you bring someone or you just release something that is not as good, people realize directly and they will say, what the fuck are you doing, right? Why are you doing that? doesn't make sense. You're in a great spot because you can pre-record, edit, release yeah. when, when you think, you know, it's good. Um, we have to fight against that. Unfortunately, like we, we've been sticking to this like Friday release every week, you know, for over a year now, a lot of people tell me, you know, it's in their schedule, like Saturday morning, they go to the gym, listen to the steady lads, like go for their walk on Friday night, like steady lads. So 
we want to keep putting it out. Sometimes, you know, I'm exhausted from the week, like it's gone crazy or the markets are so busy, but we're still going to do an hour and yeah. hopefully it's not a filler, but. But yeah. Jordy is such a jet setter. It's, he has such dedication. Like we'll be on the call and taking out, it'll be like 9 a.m., 10 a.m. We're fully refreshed. And Jordy, it'll be like, oh yeah, it's 2.30 a.m. here. But he pushes through it and somehow you never seem tired. So Yeah. Yeah. You still sleep uh, four hours every two days. This week, yes. Um, but like the previous month has been good. What's a good uh, month for you in terms of sleep? Um, sleep every night? At least. Six to eight, hopefully. I don't know, about eight. I don't think I'm six to seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not bad. I am prioritizing health now. I think um, personally I've escaped the, um, the fear of, you know, not being up for something. I'm willing to um, not be perfect with execution of everything I'm doing to get rest and get sleep. You know, you, that changed in the last year. I remember a yeah, year changed, ago you said the changed opposite. Massively, yeah, yeah. yeah. What changed? I mean, why did it change? Um, one, I'm out, of, I'm out of survival mode. So when you're starting a business, you're an entrepreneur, that first like few years is make or like, you know, yeah. you know how it is, it's make or break. Oh. And um, you front load. So I front loaded a lot. I've bootstrapped um, a significant amount of safety now. Um, and I think it's time to be smarter instead of harder. Yeah. Let's talk about the psychology of investing. So people know each and every one of you. And so I want to take some examples of you guys, even one of me, because I also have to make fun of myself, right? Where we're going to understand the kind of biggest mistakes we make in investing and explain, explain them, right? So I have to start with you, Justin. No. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it had to be him. Yeah. Why is it so hard to uh, sell an underperforming asset? Why is it so hard to sell ETH? Well, I think in our industry, let's just talk about crypto for now as opposed to like investing broadly. For me, and I think all of us here, we're in this industry because we're taking a position that in 10 years, crypto is going to be bigger than it is now. Who knows how much bigger, to what scale, what apps will be built. But I think we all fundamentally believe that. And so for me, I'm not really active in the markets. For me, I'm probably 90% of my portfolio does not move in a given year. It does not change. Of course, we have your airdrops that come in, some venture deals that distribute tokens, etc. That's a little bit different, but it's smaller than your greater portfolio. But for me, I am just have a strong bias towards not selling something I think is going to be doing well in 10 years. I understand there's people that are really talented at timing markets, timing cycles. I think it's really hard to do. I think 99% of people probably can't do it. I don't think I'm one of them, even though I live and breathe in this space. And I get to talk to these guys that do it professionally and whatnot every day. But it's still so hard that it's something I try not to worry about personally, making most of my money by trading. So I'm in it for the long run. I'm holding for the long run. And uh, we'll see what happens. Obviously, I wish I swapped my ETH for Sol or my ETH for BTC a year ago, but here we are. Why is it so hard to not buy the dip or to sell when something is crashing? I'll give my own example. Luna two years ago, <laughs> where I watched $7 million melt into $5 in two days. Mm -hmm. So the chance I had was, I mean, I say it's, I was doing this uh, Biluna Luna arbitrage, so I couldn't sell, right? But, and people would say, oh, but you didn't sell, you didn't sell, why? And say, oh yeah, but I was doing this uh, Biluna Luna arbitrage. I was locked in for 21 days. The actual truth is I probably would not have been able to sell. And I know some guys who were buying like 500K or a million dollar at $5, buying the dip, right? And they had already like, one of these, they had the, uh, $250 million in Luna, and he was still buying the dip, right? Why? Why are we like that? I think people get religiously attached to um, an asset. An asset's like a football team for them. It's like their culture. It's, you know, something that we're seeing over and over again, especially the ones that have a leader that's kind of cult-like. You can follow them. They're very charismatic or they're very good on Twitter. Um, they create an emotional connection with that token. This is like, you know, the drug of crypto. And I think you, you wouldn't have sold anyway because you would be like, oh, I'm not going to sell 
at $1 million, I was at seven. And then I'm not going to sell 100K. You know, you still hold it down to zero. Don't worry. Of course. <laughs> Don't worry. Of course. <laughs> uh, that's what I feel. I think yeah. I would still have, a, I, would, I would not have been able to sell. Yeah, yeah. You were just kind of going through the educational uh, cycle for you. But crypto is a little bit different in that like we, like assets like Luna can actually go down so massively like that, right? These like longer tail, more niche tokens, even though Luna was yeah, huge. It was like a top 10 it was, token. It was man. a top yeah. five. I think it was number yeah. four. Yeah. So I was thinking it's too big to fail, it's well, to fail right? 40 to 60 billion. No, no, no. But it's it was it was a fundamentally <laughs> unsound system that could theoretically go to zero, whereas like something like Ethereum, it's easy to... Yeah, for, but even... It's because when you feel like... You, I knew it was theoretically be able to go to zero, but it's too big to fail. You always find excuses. Yeah, Jump's right? going to come in and save us. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Don't want like, he has the money. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah steady, steady <laughs> lads, very steady <laughs> lads. But it's, it's because pe people get conditioned that, okay, I buy the dip, I make money, right? You get conditioned to believe that a certain action makes money, and then it keeps happening until it doesn't. Um, it's, it's like a thousand and one days of a Thanksgiving turkey. It just keeps going up until it goes to zero the next day. Uh, so I, I think you just have to have the mindset that all, like, all this shit can go to zero, you know? Like you have to have some stop, some, some form of a stop loss and understand that, yeah. Like. For, for me though, it's actually quite easier to buy assets when they're nuking. So I very much believe in the Warren Buffett buy when there's blood in the streets mentality. And for me, like I really do believe this industry is going to grow in 10 years. So in some ways, yes, of course it's sad if ETH crashes 50% tomorrow or Bitcoin does, but it's also an amazing opportunity to now like reallocate to something you think is going to be strong in the next decade. What's the classic educational cycle and what do people learn kind of first cycle and then second cycle, what do they do differently? And what's the, what's the right way to approach crypto investing? I don't want to, say to avoid that because it has, to have, it has to happen. I had Joe McCann the other day, he said, you have to blow up twice, right? I don't agree that you have to blow up twice. I think once is enough. <laughs> yeah. Do you I have disagree. to blow up once though? If it's twice, you, it's going to happen to you more than twice. It means um, there's there's like a black uh, blind spot. Look, um, it's not just for investing. I think for entrepreneurs as well. I talked to a lot of founders and the ones that have, uh, you know, hit it big at 20, 25 years old, like super young. And they've, you know, like the pump fund founders, you know, 21 years old, hundreds of millions. Um their view of the world you need to understand is that they've not seen the bad thing happen. Everything sort of like mm. goes well. And there are cases like Mark Zuckerberg where it just continues to go well. And so they don't know if they're Mark Zuckerberg or not. They have to go through some turbulence and test themselves. Um, as an investor, you're coming into crypto, you're investing in S&P 500, let's say since like 2009, <laughs> the chart is up only. And, you know, when COVID happened, I think people saw a drawdown, um, even though it, you know, it, it veed mm -hmm. that they were not used to dealing with. And like you said, some people make emotional decisions. They, they panic. Um, you went through that extreme case because your asset literally went to zero, not just like a little bit. 20, 30, 40%. Down. I think the craziest thing was actually it never goes to zero. There is always an additional zero after <laughs> the coma. I didn't realize that, right? Yeah. I was like, so it's not like you're killed and it's zero. It's like 0 0.1, 0 0.01, yeah. 0 0 0.00. And then at some point you're like, like you're like, it's actually like it's never ending, right? Yeah. They kept like FTX kept adding uh, more decimal points that day. My God. And then at some point they ended, uh, they filled up. And that's when it bounced. I remember going to bed when Luna was crashing and it was down like 99.999. And it was at 0 0.000025 because that was the tick size at the end. They didn't have ones, it was 25. And I put some limit orders at 25, but it bounced off of 0 0.00050. And I think like a thousand X from there. <laughs> um, so I missed it. I missed a thousand X by one tick. You say I missed it. Just in the other day, we were talking about Sui, mm. right? And you said, I feel like I missed it. There is this psychology mm. in crypto where you say, the thing pumped, I feel like I missed it. And then we end up not buying. When sometimes that's when you should kind of double down, right? I had the Daryl Wong on the podcast and he was saying, he was explaining with the sole example, when even after two or three eggs, they were actually saying, now we need to double down and 
and bet bigger. Why do we have this, I feel like I missed it, psychology? That has probably cost me the most money in this space, honestly. I've learned this lesson that's so hard to internalize, but I've learned when I hear about something from a trusted person, the first time I hear about it, even if the asset has done really well in the past week, two weeks, and I feel like I've missed it, when I hear about it, because we live and breathe this space, it's still early, but it's still so hard to actually take action just because you look at the past two weeks and this thing could be up 30, 40, 50%. Who wants to buy then? But I'm trying to internalize that when I see something, it usually is early. I don't know. Do you guys have that experience too? I, I feel like one thing you can do is if you hear something, you can just buy like hundred bucks of an asset. Mm. And once you own a little bit, you'll just pay more attention. And, you know, you, it's, it's like a negligible amount, right? Like hundred bucks for most of us. So just buy it. Right, see how it feels. It's like not so bad, right? You look into the fundamentals. Oh, okay, it's it's decent. You buy more, see how it feels. Um, and I, I feel like the only way to learn is to have skin in the game. But I think you can't really outsource your conviction, right? You have to have your own conviction because if you buy something that someone's showing you, then you know if it goes down 10, 20 percent, it's like, oh fuck, this this is going to zero, anyways. So, Jordy, do you believe in this Druckenmiller thesis of like just? The first time you hear about it, ape a small amount, and then you don't miss it, and then you do your research and you add more? No, I don't understand what you guys are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I have a small amount and <laughs> it's it's going up, then I still feel like I missed it. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's never enough. I always think about my sizing a lot. I think more more than most people, I really optimize my sizing on my bets, and having a small amount just... It doesn't fit my function. My function is risk reward uh, and like time horizon. So um, I'll either do it or, or not do it. Yeah. So what, what's your minimum position sizing? Like 10%, 5%? What, of my portfolio? Yeah. 10% minimum? What do you thought? Or 5%? <laughs> no, no. I mean, it, I mean, it can be like 1% or 2%. One or but two. That's, yeah, that's going to be like meaningful. Um, I remember, I think it was about a year ago you were on this podcast, mm -hmm. almost the same place, right? Yeah. You were saying, I was asking you a, a question about Solana because yeah. I knew we could clip that because I knew we we're kind of like not really, we we're saying it's kind of a meme coin, et cetera. And I knew we could clip that and make people angry, right? I said it will never hit an all-time high. Again, like it won't, it won't surpass its all-time high. Do you still believe the same? I mean, yeah. Basically what people understand, one is there's dilution. Um, so the market cap can be higher than it was. Mm -hmm. The price, you know, validators are kind of being paid. I think it's eight, five, eight percent. I think on Solana. Can't remember so, somewhere in that region. Um, so you're kind of fighting against that uphill battle, and you know, unfortunately, a lot of people don't stake or don't optimize their assets like they should. Um, obviously, Bitcoin doesn't have any staking, so that's a little bit of a a different story. We had a little cope the other day. We did our ETH cope, ETH uh, BTC cope. And I was saying, like, actually, if, if you've been staking your ETH for last year <laughs> and, and restaking it no, no, no. and getting, like, all the extra stuff, the, ETH, the, the, the Bitcoin chart is not so bad. Like, it's... it's How have you co-opted this cope? This was... Ty Taiki was telling me this on the podcast months ago, and you, I think, shunned that idea. Now we're all... So, you're trust me, not so bad. Trust me, I, I'm, I'm like a hardcore airdrop farmer, and I'm in pain holding ETH. I mean, fortunately, like, I, I hold like other assets and whatnot, but. No, but I it's simply, like, I mean, simple math, right? Like you, you, you can easily get 10% yield if you're mm. farming with your ETH, right? Yeah. yeah. So if um, year to date, you know, this is an extreme year. Like I think Bitcoin ETH divergence is 50%. Yeah. Um, helps a little bit, you know, 20, like some, some part of it. It's not going to keep going 50% every year. Right? Like, I think like you'll have years where it's flat, flat, and then you, you make 10% back. So, um, listen, I strongly believe that having diversity in your portfolio is, is the real alpha and having assets that each have a bit of a different distribution is really good. So Ethereum, Bitcoin have just different return profiles. Um, obviously this year it's been Bitcoin, but it could play out differently in the future. Yeah. But like, but like you said earlier, you, you know, now, you know, you front loaded all the hard work and now you're more comfortable, but I guess for, for people like me, I still want to 
gets to some like level like you. Uh, so for me, I, I have to concentrate and it's hard for me to expect outsized returns in the, the majors. Um, maybe Solana can be a part of the, the, the basket and whatnot. Uh, so I feel like it kind of depends where you are in life as well. Uh, whether or not in the diversity I found a little of the work when it comes to building a business, you know, when, it, when it's come, it comes to building um, your net worth, like your, mm -hmm. your portfolio value, you can't front load that. That is a long, like you have to just keep accumulating year right. after year and just not blow up or blow up once mm -hmm. max, you know, because every time you blow up, you, you kind of like, you learn the lessons, but um, you're compounding resets. Mm. Completely. Brutal. Yeah. Do, you, do you think blowing up is necessary though? I mean, I've you never have to blow up, but you have to have, um, you have to test your limits. That's what I was trying to say. Like people need to test their limits and see that they fail somewhere. Something fails, like your intuition misleads you. Then you can't trust it always. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like where you, you see where the universe's uh, limits lie and you stay, you stay in your lane kind mm -hmm. of, right? Mm -hmm. um, you just don't want it to be fatal. I mean, we've had people in the industry that, um, might not recover, right? Um, yeah. So. And blowing up builds self awareness. And I, if you, if you think about compounding, I feel like if we're doing a podcast, our reputation and our credibility and our audience compounds. But when it comes to money, right, you can blow up. Mm. So I feel like oh, you can do it with uh, your reputation can be disintegrated. Can you can build it for ten years, do podcasts every week, do a thousand episodes. And then, you know, you have one mistake of judgment and, and it's gone. So I don't, I think you can blow up. That's fair. Well. I, I feel like we have so more control over even people's attention span is so short, right? One day, oh, maybe you made a mistake. You're an asshole, whatever. But like the day after, everybody's already onto the next story. I feel that's kind of the, I mean, as long as the mistake is not too huge in terms of like branding, but... That, that's, that's like an excuse, right? It's like, oh, people are going to forget anyway, so people don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, let's just scam. I, mean, I feel like that's like a really wrong mentality to have. I feel like you need to have core values that you stick to. I, I do agree with your sentiment. Like, I don't think you should give in to cancellation if that were to happen to you. I think you can keep building through that. Uh, Andrew Huberman, the big podcaster, mm -hmm. you know, almost went through a cancellation, but he just kept building, kept working. See, this is what you don't understand, though. It. Like, Huberman's cancellation was not related to his for mm. a product, which was like, you know, educating people on health topics. True. It was like, oh, he like, you know, Dating was lying scandals. to some girls yeah. or whatever. Mm. His audience is not going to care about that. However, let's say you're Arthur Hayes and your, you know, your audience relies on you for um, predictions about macro or the market. And, you know, you, you're like very, very convicted and you go out there and you're, you're very strongly convicted and you're wrong and then wrong, wrong, wrong. At that point, yeah. It's core to your brand. So you have to be a little bit um, careful about what you're yeah. uh, getting wrong, let's say. But I do think people and audiences are forgiving. I mean, no one, no one's perfect. I mean, we've all, I mean, I'm the ETH bag holder. We all have our takes in Solana or like some other longer tail DeFi assets. And everyone expects like you can't get everything right, right? And so I think if you operate in good faith, that's like 99% of the battle. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get people so many things wrong, that, right? but I think people understand that I have good intentions and I'm not well, like I'm not ill-intentioned. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. people are forgiving. This is like why having Taiki on our podcast is um, such a good, you know, cornerstone, let's say out of the four people usually we have on, on a show, you have someone that um, has turned down all these like seed rounds and all these things because he, he like, you know, and I, I know now maybe... Um, you're, you're doing an echo group and, yeah, and yeah. changing that a little bit, but um, he has given up dollar, like real dollars and like real, like crazy opportunity in order to keep himself, you know, uh, pure, like, you know, aligned with uh, his community and not biased by opportunities that he's seeing. We want to have someone that has that perspective because people listen to the show and like, okay, what's his take? Okay, because he's like the clean guy. Maybe a little bit mid-curve sometimes, but <laughs> like he's not trying to like swindle you. Oh. You can like let your guard down. You talk to me, you know, hopefully I've built a reputation for like very kind of first principles thinking. So I'm looking at it and I might say, you know, look, you like Solana. Like I like Solana, but I, I hate the fact that the, it's a VC coin and it's going to have unlocks. I like everything else about it. 
I might be early to this and people next year might, we might do a podcast next year and you're like, you know, guys, why, why is Solana like not going anywhere? And it's like, well, there's these unlocks that started in March that are killing it. And the community is really reflective as we're seeing with Ethereum. Um, but I, I kind of think of it from that perspective. And I think Justin has like a huge strength. He's very inquisitive. He's very curious. He likes trying a lot of stuff. And that brings a lot of like knowledge and information because he asks questions that people want to ask. Mm -hmm. We always see in the comments, like Justin is the GCR of asking questions. Yeah, like yeah. He, he's asking <laughs> the things that might be like basic or might, people might, might be shy to ask. You, you know what someone told me at our meetup a few days ago? They said, Justin, you were put on this planet to extract as much alpha as possible from Jordy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thank you. That's great. <laughs> Just one thing on, uh, you said, uh, I think there is a uh, alpha in diversification, right? I had Raul Pal in your seat and he's basically thinking the exact opposite. He's pretty much all in on the soul, right? Raul Pal has had a lot of bad calls <laughs> <laughs> and um, I like him. I like Raul. He's incredibly well-spoken. Mm. He talks with this um, charisma and he's seen a lot of things and he's very worldly. Um, I would diversify my um, people that I listen to, not just Raul mm. on this stuff. Yeah. I mean, he, he's made it, right? So I guess we shouldn't really, uh, like no one, no one should just listen to one person, right? Everyone should just listen to like 10 people. All right, and form your own ideas. Uh, I mean, the way to think about it is, okay, you have high conviction in Solana, let's say, or some bet. That can be okay if you have some unique insight that nobody else has. Like, do you have some private kind of, you know, way to look at it that nobody else is understanding? And the market is so inefficient and mispriced that you should be all in on this thing. Then, okay, that's totally fine. You're talking about a, a very large asset with millions of holders already, all the funds are already in. People understand what the roadmap is, what's going on. It's it's hard to be so concentrated on something that um, has consensus already, right? Yeah. One, one thing I realized on the Singapore trip is I've been talking to a lot of fund managers and we talked about this in the live study last episode too, but... Everyone is just bearish ETH and Celestia because of the unlock and bullish Solana and like Ave because I mean, it's going up. Do you think going to these conferences, talking to people, talking to maybe a few funds, seeing what is quote unquote consensus, do, do you think it is consensus or do you think it's just that a subset of group or subset of individuals uh, and you're like kind of extrapolating what consensus means for the entire market? Yeah, let's let's refill the wine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I mean, when it comes to like alpha from conferences, Thank you're right that a lot of it is not what people say, but just looking at how much money is being spent <laughs> on parties. You know, which projects are um, trying to push what out there. I don't know if um, you were ta you were having a hot take that you think you think conferences are a waste of time. I think that's a great way to uh, continue, actually. The, the, the next session section is like lads thoughts discussed mm. and one of them is that like what's the business of conferences do they make sense for crypto people crypto native people and who are the people who are even there like who are all these 30,000 people yeah I, 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 the hot take you're referring to I, I tweeted out like these conferences are vacation as a service <laughs> where teams have I guess an excuse to spend their treasury dollars or sell their tokens to you know, buy people's ho like hotel rooms and plane tickets and whatnot. I was more referring to token 2049, like these sponsors. Um, I, I angered like the actual builders, which I guess I should have considered. But for example, like we were on the Zebu stage, right? We've never heard of Zebu before. Apparently it's a $23 billion FTV token. I, I, was, I was like more talking about those types of projects. I, nothing against Zebu, of course. Thank you for sponsoring our, 20, our panel. <laughs> 20 to $30 billion. It's 27 billion, seventh largest project by FTV, Zebu coin. It's a what telecom infrastructure token. 
I mean, it's just, it's not real. I mean, it's but a real not, token, but, but it's, it's a skin. It's not even <laughs> <laughs> like a cup, right? Yeah, have you done there. your research, it's Justin? Not, yeah, you can type it in Zebu, and it's it's there. Yeah, yeah they just don't list it. They don't rank it. It's it's not Zebu. It's Zebu. Zebu. I see like uh, four thousand nine hundred eighty-three. Oh, that's the, the number. Where's another one? Z e e b u. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So I, I, I was more afraid to those projects. Okay. Zebu. You know. Yeah. Look at the FTV. Twenty-three billion. I mean, I can launch a you know a Kevin token tomorrow, and like, I'll only give out a few tokens, and then I can make the market cap, you know, a trillion dollars by just having a thousand dollar per coin price, and you only have a couple coins. Nobody has any coins, so it, I don't know who the holders are or what these things are. Look, vacation as a service, um, I don't feel like I'm on vacation when I'm at these things. I feel like a that I'm grinding, like the yeah. amount of people that you have to talk to in one day. Um, I'm extrovert, introvert, and I need to recharge. I do don't, you, yeah. Do you feel like it's efficient or effective to get something yes. out of all these conversations? And what do you get out of it if yes? All these people that you um, talk to on Telegram, even the ones that you occasionally can have video calls with and then talk to them in video, uh, being around them, getting their aura, having a chance to see if they're, you know, like the Eclipse founder obviously was going out to these events and, um, you know, people could see him <laughs> doing all kinds of various behaviors. <laughs> it's information. Like, it's useful. It's valuable. Uh, it can make you more bearish or more bullish. You talk to someone in person, sometimes they're, they're really impressive. Like I talked to a founder just this morning sit down with him for a coffee. If I did it over a video call, I wouldn't like get mm -hmm. as convicted that like, you can tell from micro expressions, just from uh, seeing him that this guy's legit. He's, he's building a wearables thing. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll have a, a new step in next year and a new successful um, kind of hybrid product. We'll see. You said, Justin, 95% 95 of the project at the booth of a conference make no sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I, I had this eye-opening experience more so at Token. I've usually gone to like Ethereum conferences or like DevCon, mm -hmm. Ethereum, ETH Denver, etc. Something about this conference, I think, first of all, Token 2049 is the best organized conference I've been at. It's so professional. They do an amazing job. But I do think the sponsorships and booths, there's less curation. And I think it's probably more... There's no curation. It's just spend money, right? It's a business. So, it's but, a business. but that's different. Yeah. Some other conferences don't operate like that. Some actually you have to apply. What's your project doing? How's it being built? Do you have a token, et cetera, et cetera? I think here it is truly a business that allows them to create a world-class experience. I mean, it's at the Marina Bay Sands. They rent out the whole expo center. They have all the F1 drivers. Yes. Like it's, As it's speakers, huge. they've organized this beautifully for us there was no confusion about where to go i've talked at other places and it's just like you meet in a back room and then they throw you up there mm -hmm. they do a great job organizing i think in part because it's so financialized and they allow to journey's point anyone to sponsor if they're willing to pay up but that's not how i, I would run a conference so like i would not allow a zebu i mean the main question is like who is giving them money to buy the booth because we're talking about Ab that's what my question before that just like it looks like Absolutely. they just took the the key buzzwords and they say, okay, this is a dog coin on the L2 yeah. <laughs> with the rehypothecation. Let's go. Where is oh, the money but, coming from? Who, yeah. who is but, funding this and stuff? We live and breathe this space. <laughs> and I, we walk around the convention center and we see all these booths and like nine out of 10 projects I've never heard about, which really shouldn't be the case. Like we talk about <laughs> every single project all the time. And so I'm wondering like, who are these people? Where are they coming from? And who's paying for the projects? It's, it's absolutely bonkers. Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that there must be VCs who can't get deal flow mm. in like the, the stuff that, you know, the monads and this stuff. And then they, they invest in, um, competitors who might not have a, as established presence. And I don't even know if it's effective spend because who is going to the token 2049 and then buying the the random token that they're seeing, maybe some people, but. So I did a little, I, I agree to that point. Um, I did a little research on Zebu. So I went to the landing page. I watched their like marketing videos. I went to their YouTube channel. No one's really watching these videos. They all have like 40 views, 50 views, but all of the videos for Zebu were like 
Zebu is a top tier sponsor at Token Dubai, Token 2049 Dubai. And then there was footage of like the Zebu booth. And I do think you can sort of attach yourself to the credibility of a conference. And I think that's probably the strategy. But the counterpoint is like Taiki mentioned this to me is like, if you've already heard about the project, what's the point of the booth? Like the booth should be the booths are there for projects you've never heard about for you to learn and discover them, which, you know, there's merit to that too. Mm. No, I think um, definitely like, uh, for Ethereum conference, let's say like every major Ethereum project should have a booth, mm. go around, maybe even have one of the co-founders just hanging out and not just like random kind yeah. of uh, representatives. Um, we we walked past some of the projects that were investors in and it was nice to see yeah. some of the actual builders there and having conversations. You can get feedback on the ground. Yeah. And it's not always going to be like this. It's actually really amazing how easy it is to have access to founders and projects. Like if you guys have read the Steve Jobs biography, he talks about how he called up, I think the Hewlett Packard CEO, just looked him up in the phone in like the, the yellow pages, called him up and got an internship. Our space is actually still very much like that. It's still early enough that any old person can come to these conferences and meet the founders of amazing projects. Like Monad is a great example. Like they're just such an accessible team and there's definitely alpha if you're trying to build your career of coming here and meeting teams and meeting founders. There's a few things that are kind of weird happening in this space, right? We just discussed one. Another one I wanted to introduce with uh, this dog here on this table. And it happened this week, right? I received this dog from the Nero oh. team this week. <laughs> and for me, it's cute. for me, it's a good way to introduce this Binance weird <laughs> shit that happened this week that honestly I can't comprehend. Yeah. Maybe I'm just too naive. Maybe Jordi, you have more under understanding of the whole situation, but how is it possible? Maybe you want to explain what happened and also explain how it's possible that we have CZ that is about to get out of jail, right? But there is still weird, if not shady shit happening in Binance. Feels like things are not changing. Um, these uh, exchanges are a combination of like very effective operators and also there needs to be, you know, commercial people because if you're going to win as an exchange, if you're going to be very slow and just, you know, wait for uh, Coinbase, let's say, you know, just they're eventually going to win a bunch of stuff, a bunch of categories, just like they've won the U.S. retail market. But for Binance or Bybit or, you know, OKX, the, the big exchanges, they've had a commercial element to them that's let them grow. And there's people that are just trying to um, do deals and, and all these things. Sometimes um, there's a clash between just being commercial and sometimes you have these strange moments. Um, I think they're very large exchanges, very large companies. They have a lot of people and... Um, you know, people might be motivated with very different objective functions, different KPIs, all have KPIs. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Chinese companies, let's say, but they're very KPI focused. And sometimes mm. you see this in all kinds of things in life, but one part of the, the body might be, you know, up, trying to optimize something and that's their KPI and it ends up not being good for the whole body, right? So I think this is one of those examples. That was a very PG answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the reality, I mean, here's something I, I do want to obviously say out loud, which is there are entities in the space that you can't directly criticize if you're a participant. So Binance is one of those other large exchanges in that category. Um, if you start poisoning relationships and then none of your, you know, we've, I've heard of situations where someone pissed the wrong person off and then anything they invested in, they were on any cap table, any of their portfolio companies, you know, now they can't get listings. That's crazy. Uh, right? <laughs> wow. I, I hear that, that about the Luna case, actually, that there were many more people than were kind of talking out loud about Luna that didn't, that wanted to say something, yes. but they could not yes. because of this reason. I talked to major VCs mm -hmm. that were in private telling me like 
this thing like looks like a scam. Like, like I can't say anything out loud, but this thing is going to go to zero. And the reason they can't say out loud is one, they have connections to the other investors because they co-invest all the time. And then you don't want to FUD. It's like a, you know, uh, respect of the trade. You don't FUD somebody else's bags that yeah. <laughs> that's your yeah. friend, right? So then they end up not saying anything. And if it's a really large thing like um, Luna, FTX, like this kind of stuff, everyone's going to have friends in that. And then no one's going to speak out loud. Why were you able to? You were the biggest voice saying Luna was unsustainable. Why were you able to do that? Um, probably because we, you know, what wasn't as big at uh -huh. the time, you know, it was more of an individual thought. Yeah, yeah. So when I did, was doing it with Olympus Dow, yeah. um, oh, yeah. all these stuff, you remember? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Had you on my channel. I mean, some of those people I would say kept grudges for a long time, but a lot of them, thankfully, uh, you know, even though they hated me, they, they messaged me two years later and they're like, Legend. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> I had blinders on. Um, same with Luna, obviously, you know, I had a debate with Jose from Delphi, who was one of their biggest backers and, mm. um, you know, there's no ill will. Yeah. Um, I think I've learned how to do it respectfully now as well. Um, so, I mean, with Solana, for example, I love the community. I'm invested in so many of the apps, so very pet active participant, uh, just because I don't like VC unlocks doesn't make me yeah. kind of a, an enemy of the community. Yeah. I feel like that's also the study lads. Maybe that's something that we can do that other podcasts can't do is to speak up on things and be honest about what's happening in the space. Maybe other podcast, like VC podcasts, they're incentivized to just say nice things and say, you know, say vanilla things to just maintain their deal flow and relationships. But I feel like that's one thing that we've done a good job. Is yeah. I mean, every single one of us, if you ask us our opinion, we'll give you our honest opinion. I don't yeah. think any of us will ever sugarcoat something or fluff it up. Like we're very straightforward people. Yeah. Like even like DeFi founders, like I, I'm like really bullish DeFi right now, but I'm like fudding 95% of DeFi tokens and some founders are like upset at me, but it's like, I don't really care. You know, I'm just being honest. I'm just mid curving my, in my own lane. There's like a lot we, of props for that. I mean, there's a huge cost yeah. to doing that, right? Like it hurts deal flow, it hurts connections, it hurts speaking opportunities, all of these things. But so it takes courage. I mean, yeah, but ultimately, when you do that, you're gonna earn the respect of the real people in the space because they are able to recognize it. Yeah. So we mentioned the Luna and FTX, right? One thing that you said the other day, Justin, was a question that is very fair. Did we really wash out the bad people after FTX? Mm. You mean the bad people in the entire space or just the bad people that are running like exchanges or? So what right? I think I meant by that was, of course, we had a bear market. But the thing is, the projects that flourished out of the bear market were more, let's say, money games, as they would be called in Asia or gambling apps, as we'd say in the US. I feel like since the bottom, the projects that are actually innovative, adding value potentially could be changing our world or just something that you'd be excited about and excited to tell people about are not the ones flourishing. But what's flourished out of the bottom are these like nihilistic gambling apps. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's been really tough as someone that's trying to build in this space that's not frankly had success that wants to have success. Seeing all of these projects that I don't think are actually doing anything new and exciting. They're just changing how I'm money actually going to agree with him hands. for once. Like, <laughs> for yeah, for once. This, and I'm usually like, He's absolutely right. This is not about crypto, though. This is just, uh, you know, what markets are counter-cyclical. Alcohol, gambling, you know, if, if it's like depression, bear markets. He's people, water right now. People <laughs> are, <Fuck. laughs> you know, people are going for the, the quick scams, the, the kind of dopamine hits as cope. And it's, it's hard. It's so hard because yeah. my co-founder and I see that and we're like, we raised $8 million in 2022. And we say, imagine if we put all of that $8 million into like coming up with a meme coin or a pure gambling app like we've seen. If we just kept running that playbook back as opposed to like actually doing the work and building like complicated smart contracts, making sure the security is there, like we would have probably won. I mean, you never know. But it's just so hard seeing the things that I think are not the right things that should be succeeding succeed. I mean, even the fact that you managed to raise $8 million, was that pre-FTX? Yes, yeah, right okay. before it. Um, it's not so bad. I mean, a lot of 
projects. Look, I can't time. complain. I, uh, but it's still hard, right? The money can't solve your problems of finding product market fit, right? We have more time to explore and I'm grateful for that, but it's, it's hard. How much do you, how much do you get the um, temptation to say, Hey, I'm going to, I mean, why am I doing all this thing where, when I could just invest this money, even without buying meme coins, right? Mm. And have decent returns. Obviously, that's not what you raise the money for. But there is a bunch of projects out there that raise money and that have an amazing treasury, but are not delivering anything. And there is like a, actually a few huge ones. I've never had that temptation because our investors trusted us to use the money to build products and try to build something successful. They didn't give us the money to invest or to, you know, spend on other things. So for me, it was never really a thought. But what do you feel concretely? I, I have no regrets. I mean, sure, we it would have been great if we bought ETH when ETH was at $880, but um, that wasn't what we were given the money to do. So You mentioned meme coins before. Um, I had a meow from Jupiter on this podcast. And he says, and he really firmly believes that every meme, co uh, every coin is a meme coin. Every coin is a meme coin. Do I agree with that? No, no. Um, it's a narrative, right? Every every me every coin has a percentage of meme ness to it. Of course, it could yeah. be a hundred percent. It could be one percent. Um, I agree that in crypto, like everything is at least. 20%, but the, ra the range matters, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we got, we got to pull up the chart of like 20% of the product is fundamentals and the rest 80% yeah. is like vibes or something. It's the DJ's part right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I do think like, I really, really, really try my best not to believe that like all these tokens are meme coins because I don't want to be in a space where that's the case. I think that's like would be a poor use of honestly the four of our, us is time if we're just you know, all these coins, they don't have any intrinsic value. We're not building towards the future. We don't want to drive value to these tokens. Like, I, I just don't want to live in that what world. Is the, what is the future that you're trying to drive towards? I want, you just want to create... I want these tokens to all be securities as we see them. But what do you want them to be securities of, like, so ultimately? Like if, if you buy the Uni token, mm -hmm. I want it to be... No, so okay, but, like, Uni is already, like, something. It's a DEX. We have it at Uni, okay. But what's, what's all the other ones, like... Well, let, let me use the uni example. I think the uni token should be synonymous with uni equity. It's not just controlling a fee switch. I don't care so much about the fee switch. I think when you buy the uni token in my dream world, my utopia world, you're investing in Uniswap Labs. You're investing in what Hayden's building in the future. You're investing in the future of the company, not just the on-chain fee switch. That's that's really the world I want. Yeah, but there's 10,000 coins or more, let's say, but... Um... I'm sure you have 20 that we can say, like, you know, money market, DEX, whatever, this, this, this. Mm -hmm. Okay, those make sense. But um, you're saying you don't want the other ones to even exist? You only feel a bet on them? Oh, oh, that's a great question. No, I think they should, look, everything should exist that people build. And that's totally within people's rights. But I don't want our space to be captured by this nihilism or this, like, this meme culture where the vast majority of our value and attention is going towards meme coins. That is super fun. I've had fun doing it too. We've bought the Trump coin or the Kamala coin. It's fun. Like there's a place for gambling. I love speculating. It's fun. But that should not be the focus of our industry or our conversation. It should be like a very small subset, in my opinion. Yeah. And when I, you know, hung out with Vitalik and other founders, I think I asked a question to Vitalik, like, do you not get jaded by the space? And yeah, he, you know, he, he does get jaded. And he, he wants, maybe this kind of ties into you, but... He wants to see applications that he can sh you know, show people's grandmas and have like 90 year old people be like, oh yeah, like that is kind of cool, you know, keep, keep building young, young ones, you know, uh, I feel like there's not that much of those that exist in crypto. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of complicated financial engineering and infrastructure, yeah. um, but it's not, there's not that many things that we see millions of normies yeah. using. I, I don't know if it's going to work, but my co-founder and I have sort of been internalizing this thing of like. We probably have 10 to 20,000 DA, DAUs in crypto. It's so hard to scale in our space. The mindshare is so competitive. Mm. So right now the app we're working on, the goal is that your like your grandmother or your mom could download it and use it. And the crypto happens behind the scenes, but you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to manage it. And I think that there's merit to that process of onboarding more people into our space. 
Yeah, I mean, ultimately, just like we talked about previously, but also with products, you have broccoli and you have cheeseburger from McDonald's. So when you're making a podcast, we talked about like the two types, the, you know, the bit boy and the, the good kind of uh, informative ones. Our goal and your goal and a builder's goal should be to be a three-star Michelin chef. Absolutely. That is creating something very healthy, ideally, but also very tasty, right? Mm. Um, that's what we try to do with Steady Lads. That's what, and that's what you're trying to do. And I think as a builder, trying to build a product, the most successful ones never forget that if you lose attention and you don't make it a good experience, you're going to lose your customer. Um, and sometimes you, lo- you just have one opportunity to build a brand. If you have people try to use your brand, they come to your decks, they come to your product, and it's just like terrible, you might fix it and then try to say like, hey, I fixed it. It's too late. It's too late. You've like, um, might as well just start over at that point. Because there's only that many users in because crypto like right now. You, you, you've, tainted, you've tainted your brand. You can grind through it and people say like, oh, you know, like, um, you know, Drift was like really kind of clunky, but if you try it now, it's going to be really good, right? You can try to grind through and, 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 and recover out of, um, but ultimately it's easier to do it the first time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I really like the cheeseburger broccoli analogy, right? It's like, <laughs> if you, if you have like a regular crypto guy and you offer a broccoli, it's like, no, like, fuck you. Like, <laughs> get that away from me. But you give them a taste of the cheeseburger. It's like, oh, that's pretty good. And then you give them the broccoli. You get their attention. Then you give them like the good thing. You give them the broccoli in the cheeseburger. Yeah. And then, you know, when you say bye, you hand the cheeseburger. It's like, oh yeah, yeah I, had, I had a pretty good experience. So I'm very bullish on the very few founders that have been able to do both. Mm-hmm. And, um, some of the chains that are hyped, though, um, they have a chance because they've built a community without a product. Um, Monad, Hyperliquid, even Barachain. Very interesting ability to create the, um, the tastiness. You know, there's, there's like uh, cartoons, things that people like. They all have their cat or their dogs or their, I think Mora has some hedgehogs and Molan yeah. ducks and different things. Great. Now give them the broccoli, you know, combine it in uh, with like a very good performing technology. And let's see if you can make some magic happen. I think as a kind of closing thought, I have uh, something that you said just in the other day, which is something that I think everybody should hear and kind of accept. No one knows what the fuck is going to happen in the future. No one knows. And even the people you think know or act as if they know, they don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just have to focus on what you, what you have control over, right? That's, a, that's like the only thing you can yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, the inspiration for that came from Hasib had a blog post from 2017. Hasib is, I think, the managing partner of Dragonfly, one of the most successful and largest crypto funds in our space. And in 2017, he said, if you're thinking about an L2, building an L2, don't. Everyone's already been working on that for years. The problem is well known. Everyone's trying to solve that already. You're going to be late and don't try to build another L1. And it really just goes to show like even the most prolific minds in our space, and this is not to knock him at all, we're all guilty of it, but no one can predict the future. Obviously, 2017 would have been the perfect time to start an L2. 2018 as well, 2019, probably even 2020. A lot of the most popular L2s, you know, are just came about in recent years. So, yeah. I guess, yeah, like having humility, right? Just not having an ego. Uh, I could be wrong. We, we could all be wrong. It is what it is. I think you, you, you again, you, that's the broccoli talk, man. These guys are broccoli boys. I don't know. <laughs> broccoli boys? You gotta, you gotta have <laughs> your hot takes. You gotta, you gotta give people hot takes aggressively, like, you know, say something that uh, you predict and then say that it's, you know, it's 95, it's not, you can never be 100%. So yeah. what's the hot take now? ETH, uh, ETH going up, Sol going down? That's the last question. <laughs> what's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? For me? Everyone. One after the other. Let's, the let's Broccoli start, Boys let's, first. Let's start with DeFi Boys. Broccoli Boys, DeFi, DeFi Boys? DeFi I mean, boys. <laughs> I'm, I'm Omega long DeFi coins. Uh, I mean, I'm super long Aave in, in the uni. I, I feel like, I mean, look, I, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I feel like the pendulum has swung t- too far towards financial nihilism. 
that I think the next logical step, I, I feel like people want to believe in something. People want to see a world where... Are you people? Or do you think the majority of the people? Or do you think, I mean, on the other side of the pendulum, meme coins, right? If market pick up again, I mean, 50% rate cut, what does the little guy do? Does the little guy do? I mean, I, I feel like one problem that, or one mistake that people have in the industry is that they just assume retail is just like 50 IQ meme coin gamblers. But I feel like the majority of retail like actually want to make fundamental investments, right? Even if you look at regular, regular retail in the stock world, you know, they do their research, they buy a stock because they think that it's going to you know, 10x because of like fundamental reasons. Um, I feel like we don't really target those people or maybe crypto generally attracts people that only go for like the hundred X's and, you know, we see like the pump funds of the world benefit because of, I guess, those types of psychographics. Um, but like, what, what even was the original question? The, What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? B biggest prediction? Uh, no, like the return of DeFi, DeFi coins hit all time highs, like all the OG DeFi coins, Ave, Uni. Actually, it's just those two, yeah. Other, others are kind of trash. <laughs> <laughs> Most DeFi coins are trash, but the good ones will hit all time highs. Second broccoli boy. <laughs> All right. I think for me, it's pretty clear. If you're at this conference, of, as we've talked about, everyone is excited about Solana. I think if you're holding Solana and you're massively long Solana, that should scare you. I think if you actually look at what users are doing and where they're spending their time, the L2s are growing massively on Ethereum. I think there is a big debate on if L2s extract value or add value, but I think in some ways that maybe might be the mid curve view. The point is more people are using Ethereum products, more people are holding Ethereum. Most of the innovation is still on Ethereum to this day. Most of the apps are still on Ethereum. I think you want to be longer Ethereum than Solana over the next year. I know I've been saying that for a while. Uh, of course, a broken clock is right twice a day, but I do think we're going to be, Ethereum's going to do well. Um, I think the caveat to that and the caveat to the altcoin thesis is I do think Kamala Harris probably wins. And I do think if she wins, that effectively means we'll have Operation Choke Point 3.0, likely. And I think that means that we're going to see less progress around how applications are built in the US and how value go, is delivered to tokens. And so I think that's sort of like the thorn in this thesis. But I think you want to be long ETH over Seoul. Don't always follow consensus. Don't always follow the herd. I think that's really dangerous. That's how you get burnt. Let's ask the burger boy. <laughs> burger boy. <laughs> the burger I mean, broccoli uh, boy. Your, your 12 months is, puts me in a tough spot because I'm very good at predicting, uh, you know, next weeks because I, I really see the flows and I see what's happening. I really know what's going to happen uh, in the very, very short term. And I'm, I've been proven over time, over the years that I'm quite perceptive from first principles at predicting five years or three years, you know, quite long term, and mm. eventually those things happen. I'm often early. So um, when I say a 12 month prediction could happen in three years, and, and we'll see. Um, so I, I can't really say too much about 12 months. My main takes are um, the difference between a meme coin and not meme coin will start differentiating. And, um, you know, I like meow, but I think that the <laughs> putting it all together and it's just like, it's all the same thing, like this stuff. Um, I don't know if it's 12 months. Something that I spend a lot of my time on is differentiating these different assets. Um, I think the space is learning through all the super intelligent people I meet that we're collectively trying to figure out what are these assets that we've all created and these dogs and like oh, how many narrows and like, how do we determine the real value? Um, the role of exchanges, the role of individual countries that are not part of the English speaking crypto Twitter. You know, you have massive countries like Turkey, Japan, Korea, Brazil, they have their own echo chambers. What's their impact on specific parts of the market? Mm. It's, it's taken me many years, but like I've started to understand the influence of all these factors that you don't see day to day if you're just in one part of the world and one part of um, media. So I believe that we're figuring things out. The role of tokenomics 
I mean, my hottest take is like, tokenomics are complete trash right now. Mm. We'll be looking back in 10 years at the dumb shit that people were designing their projects around. And it'll just look like barbaric. Um, it's a very difficult topic. And you need to understand that founders of a product don't usually have expertise in this kind of tokenomics or in the sort of more token as a service, as a product. They're building their chain. They're not mm -hmm. building a token. Um, we'll eventually get a lot of better things right. Right now we're in the crisis mode. It's just like, oh no, high, high, high FTV, low float. We're all losing money. Yeah, the tokenomics are complete trash. Mm. But uh, in 12 months, we, we will start to have better models around that. Um, and it might become an investable asset class for these normal people who just want to, you know, put 20% of their savings into something that will you know, give them good returns over time and, and, and be sustainable. But you're, you're bullish for the next year. It sounds like, um, look, I've been very public that if you're short anything against the dollar, you're long the dollar and you don't want to be long the dollar. Mm -hmm. So the bears have not convinced me because I always know that money printing keeps coming liquidity will not stop. We are nowhere near the end of the political desire to print money. I've seen in Europe when they've had periods like Germany 10 years ago around this, this time, they created this like huge austerity and they convinced their population that this is for the best. And inflation went to like negative in the Euro, they have negative interest rates. We are so far away from that with the US dollar. There is so much from both sides desire to just make people happy and just print money that you have to be long sound money and sound or even speculative stuff. Cause that, that will also do very well. You cannot be long the dollar. Hmm. That's it. Amazing guys. I really want to thank you for making it today. First of all, but even more for making my week every week <laughs> and probably the week of many other people. Right. Thank you. Uh, like this, I think this mix of, uh, alpha and, uh, fun and not taking your, yourself seriously is so needed. And, uh, I am a very normal person. So I guess if I love it, there's probably many other people who love it and appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And I also want to take a moment, uh, at the meetup events that we had, I had a few people few people thank me for the content that we've been providing and it meant a lot to me. So I also want to thank you, Jordy, you, Justin, and you also, Kevin, for, you know, just, I guess, like building Steady Labs with me. And also, you know, you, uh, you, you helped me like inspire myself and, you know, seeing you grind also like makes me think that I need to grind harder. So thank you, everyone here. Uh, cheers. 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 Yeah, my, cheers. Cheers, guys. <laughs> Crypto wouldn't be the same without you guys. So <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs>